Hello, welcome all. Welcome to this first edition of the Art and Craft of Game Programming. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Ivo Duarte. Uh, Ivo Duarte worked in uh, several gigs uh, in game programming, and now, after traveling through Spain, Uni the United Kingdom, and Sweden, he finally came to Portugal where he is creating the inner sea and he's going to show us today a bit of what he is doing in this game. So without further ado. Okay. Hello. Hey, uh, yes. Hello. Um, I was asked to do this in English, so but I am Portuguese. Um, so, I'm, I'm here to talk about a bit um, the game that I'm currently working on, which is called The Inner Sea, and I've been working on for about, uh, on it for about a year and a half. And I'll be talking about one aspect uh, more specifically, I'll be talking about procedural regeneration. Because th this game is actually done by a very small team, and it was actually a big, uh, it, it was a, a requirement for us to, to be able to produce. Uh, enough content for the game. So, yes, I, I will start now. <clears throat> so, yes, who am I? Actually, I didn't know that Manuel was going to introduce me, so this is a bit irrelevant. Anyway, um, I've been working as a game programmer for a while now. For um, uh, I've graduated in 2007, I think, so for almost nine years now. <clears throat> Uh, and in that time, I've worked in several studios um, in several countries, actually, because uh, working as a game programmer in Portugal is complicated. Uh, it was, especially in 2007, it was very complicated. Um, and that's something that I really want to do. So, um, so yeah, I've, I moved, like, I worked here for a couple of years, actually, in Game Invest and in White Dreams. And then I decided to take the plunge and went to the UK. Uh, after the UK to Spain, then to Sweden, where I was working at Ubisoft. Uh, and after that, finally, I decided to come back to Portugal for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but uh, the big one was that I actually wanted to create some uh, for myself, uh, which is not going that bad, I guess. Um, so that's me. So, like, uh, what's the issue here? Like, what, are, what am I talking about here about um, procedural generation? I want to give you a bit of background on the, um, why I chose this path. Um, so one of the reasons is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, is we're an extremely small team. I'm the only guy working full time on the game. And uh, I'm working as a, a programmer, because that's what I've done for a bunch of years. And for, for the first time as well as a game designer, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, there's another dude working with this uh, on me, uh, with working on with me on this, sorry, um, which is Antoine, he's doing all the arts. But he, he actually has a full-time job, he works at a, at a company in the UK. So he, he did all the art for the inner sea in his spare time, which was tough. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that why procedural generation plays such a big part in this game? Because I didn't have uh, a, an army of artists, right? I had one artist to do all the art, and I really wanted the game to be you know, visually interesting. Um, so I have decided early on that um, the, when you see the map, the map is composed by a bunch of islands. Um, and uh, I've decided early on that I wanted to, that those islands to be you know, diverse and interesting. Um, and at the time, Antoine proposed like we would do like, you know, like Lego blocks of islands, and then we would, you know, glue them all together, and they would create something. But we didn't really have the, the you know, the manpower to do loads of island blocks that would actually allow for you know diversity in the game. So, wait, I'm sorry. Purpose. 
So this was on purpose, so I just you know, wasted it into time. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> anyway, um, where was I? Oh, so yeah, Lego blocks, right? So we didn't really have the manpower. You know, we, we didn't really have the, enough people to do loads of blocks that would allow for diversity in the game. You know, loads of different islands. So I started working on algorithms to actually generate the geometry of the islands. Uh, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, more specifically. But this is directly due to the fact that we're so few guys. And, and basically I was the one, only one full time. Um, I'm going to show you like a little video of the, of the game now, because I'm not sure if you're, you're probably not familiar with it. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. In the teeth of a storm, the like of which even the saltiest tars in our crew had never seen before. Waves the size of mountain battered us mercilessly, fore and aft, splintering the masts like kindling. Desperately clawing at any angle as the mates disappeared, wailing overboard. Crippled and wounded and trailing our rigging, we fought our way to the eye of the storm, where we found uncharted islands and unearthly calm. So, as you can see, this is a map, a possible map of the, well, one of the options actually, one of the possibilities um, of, the, of the inner sea of the game, and this is what you're exploring. <clears throat> so, you, as you can see, like the islands are, you know, they're, they're, they're at the core of the experience of what you're discovering and exploring and experiencing. Um, and some of the islands have um, cities. And well, they have they have other props and stuff like that. But basically, because because the game is uh, every time you play, there's a different map for you to explore. Because you wouldn't be explore, exploring a lot if you played once and you knew the map. No, uh, you knew exactly where that island would be next time. That wouldn't be very interesting. At least I didn't think so. But maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, so this is a possible map, and I'm showing you a couple of them. Uh, this is another one. This is another one. So there's there's still a lot of um, stuff I want to do with the map because the game is currently it's out actually, but it's in early access and I'm still working on it, you know, improving it. I mean, uh, there's some stuff that I still want to do with the map, like island groups, island chains, that kind of stuff, um, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start with island generation here, and uh, I hope I don't get super technical. Is it a PC game, a browser game? Oh, it's a PC and Mac game. Uh, yeah. Okay. We can we can have, we can do Q and A after. Like. Um, uh, oh yes. So I'm talking about Tyson generation, right? Um, this is at the core of what the map is, right? Because you're bunch basically exploring and discovering loads of islands. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how I do that, and I hope. I, it's not super, super confusing and technical, and, and you actually uh, get what I'm, what I'm saying, in a way. But otherwise, you can tell me later, if not. So, how, how does an island, you know, start by getting, how do I create an island first? I'm going to do a step-by-step -step here a little bit, uh, explaining the algorithm, which is at, at the base of everything. And, and it starts with, with generating a random polygon, you know, like a, a random shape. 
And this is done by uh, actually using uh, circle, the circle equation, let's say. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of parameters that I can pass on to the, on the math of the function that actually generates this uh, random polygon. Um, and there's like minimum, maximum radius of the island. There's a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm not going to cover that in detail because it's, it's probably not very interesting. I'm just going to explain here the, the main idea of what's, what's at the core of the island generation algorithm. So it's, it starts with a circle-like equation, right? You know, you can calculate a position by using sine and cosine. <coughs> anyway, yes. Uh, anyway, I generate, uh, let's say this is at, um, this is the center. Actually, it's not, but uh, you'll see later why I did this. Um, so I, I generate the first point with, with the angle zero. Because um, <coughs> Basically, a circle is 360 degrees, right? Uh, you, if you divide that, if you iterate on that angle for by you know, whatever you want, you can you know, iterate on the angle, and then you'll generate a point, the first on angle zero here. You'll generate the second here, here, whatever you want, right? And that will actually lead to create a polygon. Um, if I generate, like for example, four more points, or three more points in this case, uh, by iterating on the, on the circle, and uh, very on the variation of the radius, uh, I can create further points. And then, if you look at it, it starts to create a shape, right? If you take it all the way, it actually creates a random polygon like this. Uh, and this is the basis of all Iceland's generation, propping, and a bunch of stuff. Uh, because out of this, you get this, right? It's a shape there, and you've generated an island. Now, the interesting bit here <coughs> uh, is actually, you know, procedural generation, procedural generation has two, uh, two main components, usually. Uh, one of them is the generation algorithm in itself, and that's actually very easy. As you can see, this is a very easy algorithm to code, honestly. Uh, the, the interesting bit here is, uh, Choosing interesting islands, so deciding on what is because this this algorithm can give you absolute crap, like you wouldn't want that in the game. So one of one of the steps of procedural generation is validation. You know, validation of the results that you had. So how do you decide that this is a this is an interesting shape that you're happy with this shape and you want to use it or not? Because it could be absolute crap, like all jagged or you know whatever. Um, so usually it comes into two steps, right? You have like a generation routine, and routine, yeah, I think this is in English, um, and you have a method, whatever function, uh, and you have a validation one. And the validation one is picks up the result of the generation of the, you know, the result of what you generated, and looks at it and says, yeah, this is okay or no, this is crap. You can't use it. Um, and in this case, like, you know, this generation is not the person looking at it and saying, yeah, yeah, I think it feels good. So you, you got to code as well the, the rules that make a shape good. In this case, for me, a shape is good when the, well, there's, there's a very specific, actually, thing, which is, like, if you come here and you see, you know, you've, this is just a set of points, a, gr a group of points, right? Um, a list of points, basically. And what you do is you generate, a, you, can, you can get a direction between points, right? Through basic vector maths. Uh, so like from here to here, it's a direction, a vector. And from here to here is you know, a second vector. And what I do is I see the angle between these two vectors and see if it's within a certain uh, margin, right? In this case, uh, I think it, it has to be smaller than 90 degrees, if I'm not wrong. And why, why, does the, the, why do I do this? Because one of the possible outcomes of this algorithm could be, like, if I, did, if I generated a point, uh, instead of this point being here, it was, if it was here, it would create this. And this looks awful in the game, right? Um, so, so, yeah. 
So usually in procedural generation, there's you know those two steps involved. You you have uh, you know a routine that generates stuff, and one that validates uh, as you know actually being useful for you. Uh, because actually generating algorithms that are all the times right, always gener all, always generates you know good results. That's very difficult to accomplish because there's always outliers and exceptions, and and sometimes you want a bit of like total randomness. So. <laughs> Um, so it's more interesting. Um, so validation of your results is very, very important. Um, yes, exactly. Okay. So also, if you look at it, you can you can see it's um, this is like a side view of the game, and you can see you know like okay, you generate a polygon, but this is actually in 3D, right? It, it has height. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you create like a 2D polygon and create like a, a 3D mesh out of it? So if you look at it, you actually, by generating the first polygon, the first polygon as you can see here is, what I generated before was, you know, the surface of the island. I, I've outlined here, you know, in white, the, the bit that we generated previously. <coughs> so, with that generated, you can just triangulate that polygon. This is uh, trivial to do, trust me. Um, and you've got the first plane of what the island is. The second step here in this case is um, making it 3D, right? Giving it height. And for that, you need to generate these cliffs here, it's, uh, as you can see, right? And this is actually very easy to do as well, because you already have all the information that you need. Uh, by having, you know, directions here, the directions between the points, you know where the, the vector is going, right? And from that, you can calculate the, um, uh, if you do, it's an operation called uh, cross. You, you have the dot product and the cross product, yes? Yes? Yes. Yes. Um, and you can, you can calculate the right vector of the direction, right, of, of this vector's direction. I, if you cross it with uh, vector 1 in terms of height, right, mm -hmm. vertical, you get the right, you know, the outlying vector, right? This is, well, this is crucial for game, in g games in general, and, well, gameplay and, and graphics programming anyway. So by, by knowing where the right of the direction is, you can just create this. Right? You have, you know how meshes work, right? They're just a collection of points, geometry in the world that has normals and that kind of stuff. Yes? I don't see any, I see people nodding, but I don't see yes. Yes, okay. Um, okay, so basically a mesh is a, a a group of points, right? You just like you pass on a list of points to the graphics driver, and he, he assumes that it's triangles. Well, it doesn't need to be triangles, but in this case, it is triangles. Um, and he assumes that that actually forms a triangle, and then he, he tries to render with that. Um, so, like you had the, the two previous points you already had, because it was uh, the polygon that we generated earlier, right? And the third point, you know, here down here, you just uh, generated by the way that I, I told you, you know, to the right and down in the ground, <coughs> rising the rest of the polygon up. Uh, and with that, if you order your, you know, pass the information correctly to the graphics driver, you can create a mesh with this, right? First triangle, and then the, the next, the next point is exactly the same information. And you can generate it, and you can generate like a second triangle, and you can keep going and generate all the mesh, right? All the sides. And then the way we render this is by using uh, the normals. This is a bit more esoteric here. Uh, or at least I thought I was really clever when I did this. Uh, I'm not sure I am, actually. But, um, the normals of, of this plane here on the top, they point up, right? And, and of, the, of these planes here on the, on the side, the cliffs, they point like, uh, you know, not up. Uh, and by in the shader where I'm rendering, by doing the cross the dot product and seeing and comparing it to the vertical direction, I can see if it's like if it's a face pointing, you know, 
uh, horizontally or if it's a face pointing up. And then I can choose correctly the texture that I want to use it to render. Yes? And then there's a bunch of more smart stuff going on, like uh, projected map, map, map ah, projective, projected texture mapping, and lots of stuff that I'm not going to talk about because uh, probably you just get die and get bored this time. Uh, I didn't say that. Um, yes. Okay. So. Um, so that gives us the basic shape, right, of the island. Yes? Um, and as you can see, there's loads more going on there, actually. There's trees and, and bush, bushes and bush and, um, and rocks, for example, right? And yeah, those are not procedurally generated. That was Antoine, of course, because you could probably do that, but it was a pain in the ass. Uh, so, what we do is we prop the island, right? We prop the basic shape that we generated with uh, end-made props to give it, you know, life. So, but by, you know, the first, the first polygon that you have actually is all the information you need again. Because using that, you can, you can, you can for example, here these rocks at the, at the borders, they're placed on the points of where or the cliffs are, right? At the edges of the polygon. You just have to go through it, get the position of the, of the edge, and just place a rock there whenever you want, right? Um, and this was actually a big, you know, because without this it looks really boring, the islands. Uh, and with the rocks it, you know, breaks away with the patterns and it creates like visual interesting uh, stuff. And with the, with the trees and all the props inside the island, it's the same thing, right? They have like these bounding blocks. And you just check, is this bounding box, you know, generate a random position inside the island? And you just so go and say, you know, is this position inside the polygon? Yes? Okay, place a tree there. You just store that information and voila, man. Loads of different islands. Bam! Out of the blue. How awesome is this? Not very much. <laughs> okay, so this was one of the big um, challenges, actually. Um, it took a bit to get right, because there's a lot of problems that can go wrong. Uh, it's like, you know, now I'm explaining it, I'm, I'm thinking, fine, and this should have taken me like 10 minutes. Uh, it didn't take 10 minutes, no. It took uh, a lot longer. Um, because there's all these exceptions and stuff that can go wrong, and uh, procedural generation can be sometimes a pain in the ass, actually. <clears throat> but when it works, it's just beautiful, man. <laughs> There's other advantages of having the map generated like this because, like, if you uh, the map is uh, the only thing that I need to save to save this map. So you know, when you're like playing the game and then you leave the game and you come back, the only thing I need to save is like it's the seed of the random generator. And every time I seed it back into the algorithm, it just generates exactly the same world. And this is like awesome in terms of saving game because I'm basically saving like four bytes and bam. I've got the whole world in, into it. It's, it's beautiful. Trust me. Um, okay, so this was one of the things that I wanted to talk about, yes. The other very important thing is, um, which uh, is also generated procedurally, it are the cities that are on, on the islands, right? Because um, when you're exploring and out there, there's, you know, there's places where you can interact, which is cities. Um, and again, we could, we could actually, in this case, probably we could uh, make specific meshes for the cities. There's uh, like several cultures in the game. There's like, a, they're called the King, the Normans, uh, the Caliphate. Um, and there's another one which is actually based on Portuguese and Spanish that's coming, but it's not yet there in the game. Uh, and, and you can, I, I they're, you know, you can find them in the game and interact with them. You know, do missions for them, and, and they go on war, all at war with each other, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm diverging. Anyway, so one of the, the interesting things about city generation is I wanted the cities to be also, you know, without same thing as the islands, without putting, you know, creating thousands of variations for cities. Um, make them visually interesting and, and unique every time you play it. Again, a new game would start, right? 
Um, so I it took the same approach. You know, how can I go and you know, from a bunch of assets, you know, isolated assets like uh, you know, like this for example is the king, it's basically Chinese um, faction. So how can I go from like having a bunch of assets like these, you know, a few houses, a tower, a temple, uh, a castle? and actually create a visually compelling city and something that makes actually sense, you know, people look at it and it looks cool. Which is, make that, make this out of that, right? And this is actually, uh, again, I thought I was being very clever here, but probably not. Um, uh, this is actually a very uh, famous problem, an existing problem, uh, when you look at it. Because it's called, um, uh, it's actually something uh, usually studied in, um, well, it depends on the course, I guess, the name of the course, but, uh, but usually it's, it's, uh, it's studied in I, uh, IA, uh, AI, AI, yes, artificial intelligence, uh, kind of like algorithms, how to solve problems, right? You've got uh, the N Queens problem. Which puts, uh, okay, anyway. There's like several famous problems in AI, uh, and usually the, when you're studying, what, some of the, of the things that you do is like trying to come up with solutions to, for these problems. And there's like a, loads of uh, methodologies of how to solve these famous problems, let's say. Um, and this one is called the bean packing problem, right? Or bean fitting problem. Which is basically, and it's used for loads of stuff actually, which is basically, you know, I want to fit containers into a larger container. And I get like randomly get, you know, of different sizes, and I want to fit them so that they are either optimally packed without, you know, spaces in between, or, uh, or yeah, or that, exactly. Um, and there's a bunch of ways to solve this, right? Uh, I'm not going to go in depth into the algorithm here because it would bore you to death. Uh, but uh, I'm going to explain exactly how it works. So you get the first, you get, you, I'm going to explain it, yeah, you know how it works. So you, this is the container, right? The container that we have. And then we have like uh, a smaller box that you want to put in this container. So you go around it and you know, you find a place to, where, where to put it on, right? Um, and then you've got like in these containers. If you look at you know of those assets, those they're, they're bounding boxes, right? It's the same thing in 2D. It's, it's actually a completely 2D problem, right? So you're just fitting fitting the those bounding boxes of those assets into a larger container, which is, which actually is defined by the city size, um, and you're just like throwing assets inside until it doesn't fit anymore. That's it. So you go, you put the first one, the second, a bunch of them, all of them, right? And you look at it, and it's just like boxes and stuff, right? So and one, one of the things that I did also, because uh, if, a, if a city looked like this, uh, it would look very, very square and, and not very organic, let's say. Uh, so I've, I've actually removed uh, corner, corner meshes. So like buildings that were in the, in, in the four corners, I would remove them. Uh, and sometimes I remove them, sometimes I, I don't remove them actually, depending on the type of building and that kind of stuff. Uh, because sometimes it looks cool if they're there. So uh, anyway, in this case I'm removing them. Um, So you can see, right? Bam, man, cities. How fucking awesome is this? Not very much. <laughs> um, so this is a top-down view, as you can see, and, th and this was it, right? You just like fit a bunch of bounding boxes into a, you know, a larger container, and that's it. Bam, city. Uh, I was so happy, man. You, you don't, you don't <laughs> seem excited at, at all, man. It took me like fucking ages to do this, man. Jesus, man. no appreciation. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. 
actually forgot to talk about stuff. <clears throat> the, how, how are we in time, actually? I think we're okay. Yeah. Yeah? Loads still to go? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, that's a lot, actually. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, basically my slides, my, my presentation, finished here, but uh, I wanted to talk about more stuff, um, but maybe, maybe I'll, I won't actually. Anyway, yes? Um, let's, let's go and move on to the Q&A and maybe, you know, you can ask me stuff, and maybe that's more interesting. Yeah, those 15 minutes were extra time, more or less, okay? So. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. <laughs> You've got my stuff here, contacts and shit. Uh, and if you want to get in contact with me, you know, go ahead and do stuff. So if anybody wants to ask a question, please. Uh, okay. My name is Sean Ferrer. I'm in the first year of Games and Apps. I'd like to ask, what was your inspiration to do that game? The um, see. <clears throat> well, actually at the time, I'm, I really like history. And, you know, especially being Portuguese, I guess it's impossible. Not liking the, you know, discovery period and all that stuff. And at the time when, when I started, you know, thinking about working on this idea, I was playing Assassin's Creed 4, The Black Flag, which I thought it was, like, awesome. You know, you know, the ships. And I don't know if you guys played it. Did yeah. you? Yeah. I thought it was like fucking hell, man. awesome. And I thought like the actually the assassins part could you know fuck off <laughs> because it was about pirates that game. And and then I thought you know it would be awesome a game like this, but you know actually you know pirating and doing your stuff. And um, and then I started working on, on this idea. It came actually from playing that game. Um, and then that's allowed to my, you know, love for the discovery <laughs> period, exploration period, I don't know what it's called. Um, yeah, actually lead led to this game, I guess, idea. <laughs> uh, when doing the, the island generation, uh, do you have some kind of plan to also give it variety in terms of the textures and feel and general climate of the uh, island? Well, <clears throat> right now, no. <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically, they all use the same props and um, the only thing that differs uh, from island to island is, um, well, sometimes they, they, you know, sometimes an island gets a mountain, um, Sometimes it gets like weird rocks uh, or, you know, just a bunch of trees. There's some variety in there, but like basically all islands have the possibility, they're all using the same assets, right? So in terms of like climates as you were talking about, uh, I did consider it in the beginning and maybe we will add that further on because it would be cool like, I don't know, if for, for example, Caliphate um, Islands would be more like desert-like. It would be kind of cool. Um, but I'm not sure because, well, it's a game I can do whatever I want, I guess, yeah, of course. Because I was thinking, you know, it's a group of islands, they're all at the same latitude. It's a bit weird if they have like deserts and mm -hmm. ice. Uh, but it's a game, yes, I can do it. Although, not at the moment, it's not done. No. <laughs> uh, I'm George, and uh, I wanted to ask what language was all of this program in? So the, it's all done in C++, and uh, trust me, you want to learn C++ if you want to work in the game industry. Uh, it's not like you can't work on other stuff, but it's very, very important. Like, if you go to a big studio, they'll be using C++. Yeah. Um, but this game itself actually was all made from scratch, so the, I'm not using like a commercial engine, uh, it's all, it's, I did my, I rolled out my own framework um, because I like to code and I'm a bit nuts. But uh, apart from that, uh, no, yeah, it's because I really enjoy coding and I, I like the, the lower level parts as well, not just the gameplay. So I decided to do this, all of it. Yeah, that's uh, it. All right, thanks. 
Hi, I'm Bruno. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the concept for general um, generate for the random generation is awesome. Uh, so congratulations. Um, Someone that thinks a lot. <laughs> no. Well, uh, I have uh, some background in architecture. I was the first studying in architecture, and uh, when I was there, we uh, there was already a tendency or a, um, a model for uh, creating random generated uh, designs in architectural and in urban planning. So uh, that's part of the building a shape grammar for the for cities and. Uh, well, the settlements is quite awesome. I, I'm wondering if you like studying you know, the history and the context of those settlements. If you delve, um, if you dived in like real uh, concepts for creating those uh, settlements. And another question is if you are uh, thinking on implementing um, a change in the elevation inside the, the islands. For example, ah. in the future. Yes. Um, so, like for for your first question, uh, not really, man. It's it's basically random. So, whatever, whenever, like uh, there's there's a collection of uh, objects, but there's actually when when generating the cities, there are no rules. You could add that. You could add that. For example, you could place a big building at the center of the city and then radiate from that. Those kind of things. Um, but uh, right now they're actually random. I just, you know, I have a certain city size because they come in, in sizes. You can have like a capital or a city or an hamlet. And, and then I just like throw assets inside and well they fit. And when they stop fitting, that's a city. Uh, incredibly, it generates interesting uh, patterns, uh, which is cool. Uh, for your second question, uh, I did toy around with adding, and I did implement it, um, adding height variation, but it created loads of issues. Because uh, one of the things that would be cool was having like beaches, right? On the, if you look at the sea, at the at the islands, they have, they're they're surrounded by these like stain, right? Th that's supposed to be shallows. E everyone thinks it's sand, but it's supposed to be shallows. Like you can still navigate on it, um, sail on it. Um, so I, I, I actually wanted beaches on, on the islands, right? Um, but it, it looked really weird, and I had to drop the idea. But with some extra time, it would be doable, because it's, uh, it's actually quite easy to, to implement. It was just uh, sometimes like uh, from, from a triangle to other, the, the, the height variation would be too steep, and it would look like crap. It would look like a, a game from... Nintendo 64 or something like that. Just like, no, it can't be. Um. Well, I. Okay. Um, and now you, you spoke about the, um, the steep of the of the inclines. Uh, you could do like um, the the England Iceland uh, uh, landscape, like like the you are you have those. Uh, steep hills. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, like and cliffs and yeah, very high, and then uh, those yeah, true. Those uh, less steep would be the beaches. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, you just I would just need to find a way to make that look cool instead of just green and bad, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could, you could. If I if if you put enough time in it, you can do anything. That's uh, it's true. Trust me. Uh, what's the gameplay like? Yeah, I saw a ship going around, multiple ships. You can control multiple ships, I guess. You can, yeah. The, uh, the idea is that, uh, sorry. Uh, you can only like pirate and steal other ships, destroy them, maybe trade. Yep. You can keep going. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's I, I don't know the rest. That's <laughs> just what I saw from the trailer. Yeah, uh, it's uh, basically, yeah, the idea is that. that uh, uh, it's. It's kind of like a sandbox world at the moment. It's uh, it's it's only the sandbox experience that you can actually play. Like like there's no story element, and I still need to to add that. Uh, like you know, uh, there there are like basic missions, uh, but you know, quest line, a proper story, something that explains the world that hasn't isn't present at all at, at the moment. So the only thing you can, that you can do is 
is the basic gameplay. You go around, fight ships, you level up your skills, grow up your um, fleet, armada, um, and you know, yeah, pirate trades, uh, discover. There's other stuff that I didn't mention, like there's forts in the sea, and, and there's like resources that you can harvest, um, like you, you can kill walruses and take their ivory, and leave their corpses to, to rot. You know, it's not very, not very yeah. nice nowadays, but I think at the time they were doing that. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. You know. Um, so yeah, yeah. That's um, that's it. Hello, uh, my name is João. Uh, I'm actually finishing my my thesis um, on informatic engineering, and I also want to be um, a game uh, game developer, game programmer. Um, I know C++, I know all that, but what I don't know is how to break in in the industry, how to get in the industry, because it's hard in Portugal, and I don't, I don't want, to, I don't have to stay here. I can go somewhere else, but I don't know how to break in and what you should have. Like, is your degree enough, or do you have to have like something to show? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So it's very tough to break into the game industry. It's true, uh, especially in Portugal. Uh, because in Portugal, you're, I, I think now, nowadays you, you've got mini clean, so you, you can actually start with that. Um, and I've, I'm not sure about this, but I think they've grown to like huge, they're, they're like huge company now. Because I thought they were smaller, but uh, someone told me, yeah, like loads of people now. So I think they're like the only actual, you know, not, not trying to, diminish the other people you know, working in the industry and the other companies. But they're the only proper, you know, with stability and funds actually developing games in Portugal, as, as far as I know. There's a few others, uh, but, well, they're, they're a bit more advanced than I am, I think, because I'm basically myself and another dude. Um, but I don't think there's like loads of opportunities in Portugal, even at the time, even if, if nowadays, Things are progressing more, uh, so I, you know, not you never know if you apply to a company here, maybe you can you can get a job. I have an idea, uh, but I would definitely say like you should move abroad. Uh, uh, the thing is, as you were saying, a degree is not enough, and far from it. You, so you so you have an idea, man. Nobody ever asked for my degree ever. I, when I finished, I was like, dude, I could just not, do, not have done it. You know, five years, you know, I went through all the things. No one ever asked for it. You know, no one cares. But people care, actually, is your experience. You know, and what you can actually show and that, uh, that you've done. You know, so a portfolio is very, very important. Doing like a game sample, like, you know, I wouldn't say doing your own little game, but doing like something that's actually uh, visually impressive, uh, or or even in terms of code, uh, something that's actually impressive. Like if you're if you're into technology, you can do like a memory system, uh, you know, that's with heaps and that kind of stuff. But it, it needs to be. It, it's not about picking up Unity man and making something uh, walk around. You know, that's not going to impress anyone. You need to actually. Uh, you know, code uh, mesh exporter, you know, do implement shadow casting algorithms. Um, something that actually, you know, people will look at it and say, okay, you know, this guy, I can trust this guy to be, to, to, to come here and do his, and do his work. Uh, I hope I'm not being too harsh in, in general. No, no, I know, I know it's going to be hard. Yeah, but it's, it's tough, it is tough. It, obviously, we're a bit. It's even tougher for us because we're in Portugal. Because man, if you're in Sweden or or in the UK, dude, it's uh, it's way easier. Honestly, way easier. Uh, because like in the UK, there's loads of companies, man. You can't you can't lift a stone without three game companies there. It's yeah, it's awful, man. It's like, dude, fuck. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, like in the UK or in Sweden, there's way more opportunities. Even in Portugal, I think it's very tough still. It was at my time, like when I started, and, and nowadays I think it still is. Uh, you mentioned you. You mentioned you were in. You worked in Ubisoft. Mm. What was your role there? What did you do? I was coding technology. So I was working on. I was working on actually the the, the division just come out uh, a while ago, um, and uh, they actually the, after after they cancelled it. But they wanted to do like a mobile client. You actually could play the game in Android and iOS. Um, but not, not exactly the same game. Oh, oh, okay, the same game, but you would be a drone. So you're flying around and sending missiles and healing up your players. You'd be like a, a priest in, well, in World, of, World of Warcraft, like a supportive class, you know? Um, so I was working on tech for that. I was working on uh, picking up the the huge world that the vision is, that the division is, with like, like a crap ton of assets, and compressing those meshes into a format that was, that you know, was able to run in iOS and Android automatically, you know, dynamically, without having to go like single-handedly there. Um, I was working with that, like you know, the world itself. I was working with uh, the build system for for the Android, iOS, and like the platform code for those uh, platforms. Uh, I was working on a bunch of stuff, man. Okay. What, how was the, what was the feel like in the video? Did you like to work on a big company? Okay, so... Um, so, my, like... Ubisoft, like, I was working at Massive, right? In Malmo, in Sweden. Right. Uh, and I don't, I don't know about other studios of Ubisoft. Massive is actually a pretty cool place to work at, right? It has only one problem. Uh, I hope there's no Swedish people here. Right? <laughs> okay, it's in Sweden, and it's cold as fuck there. Really cold. I'm not talking. Oh, it's a bit cold. It's really cold. And now I'm joking. Well, I'm not joking. It's actually cold. But uh, <laughs> uh, but no, like um, th there were several issues there, man. I, I uh, living in Sweden. Um, wasn't like super motivating for me. I, I was there for two years, and uh, these are personal reasons, of course. Um, but it, it wasn't like the most awesome place to live, contrary to the popular belief uh, of what Scandinavian countries are. Um, although it's a very good country. Uh, but okay, I don't want to go into that uh, very specifically. Working on a AAA company, Massive. Massive is a cool company to work for. They, they treat very well their, their employees. Um, You've got like a, a, a large number of benefits, man. They they make parties. They, they give you like cinema tickets sometimes. It's pretty cool. It's really cool. They give you breakfast and shit. It's awesome. Um, and they pay well on top of it. So it's like yeah, fuck. Um, and the, the work itself is pretty interesting because you're working on like on you know high end stuff. You know like. Stuff that no one else is doing at the moment. So that's like really cool. If you're into tech, and you know, um, for me it was really cool because I'm really into technology. And I really enjoy coding, and uh, it's it's nice to be able to to be able to have that opportunity because that's not very common. Um, <clears throat> the thing is, working on a AAA game is a bit boring, and this is me personally saying this. Of course, there are plenty of people that like like it, but it's it's so many people, man. It's like only in Massive. There were like 300 guys, guys and girls, of course. And it's it's just like you're when you're talking about when you're talking about a game, like like for example, I'm talking about the Inner Sea. You know, everything that you see, or you know, 99%. It, I I coded it, you know. And when I'm talking about the division, you know, like actually most of my code probably got scrapped. Uh, because the client didn't come out, but um, anyway, like even if, I, if the game did come out, I, I would tell you, okay, I did this little bit thing here, and I did that little bit thing there, and what did you work on? And, and you're like, ah, some stuff <laughs> for like three years, and you're like, what? 
you know, like there's like guys there that are working on animation codes, and 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 you know, for example, inverse kinematics or something like that. You know, like um, like you have, you've got an even terrain, and like your feet adapt to that. You know, there's guys that were working on that shit for fucking years, man. So what did you do? Yeah, I, I, yeah, you know? <laughs> you see the feet, man? It fucking adapts to the terrain. How awesome is that? And everyone goes like, yeah, don't care. <laughs> do not give a fuck. I'm just telling, you know, these little jokes. But the thing is, you don't get uh, a sense of that you matter. You know, it's, it's like working on a, a factory. You know, this is my personal opinion, of course, you know, there's pl plenty of people that like it, I, it's, it depends on what you like. I, I like to, you know, one of the cool things about doing games is that you're doing like all this crea creative stuff, right, and you're coming up with ideas, and it's cool if your ideas matter, and if people think your ideas are cool, because if you're just another guy, you know, there coding, and if you're tired, or, you know, they go and say, Okay, we'll just put some other dude there, and he does exactly the same job that you did. Then you know you're just a little tiny cog in the machinery, and it's just it kind of loses, loses motivation. Uh, I'm talking about a lot about this. I'm sorry, but uh, it's like one of the things I found, man. I love playing like the big AAA games, like Skyrim and that kind of, especially Skyrim. Uh, but you know, the big Elder Scroll games and Fallout and all that stuff, and Assassin's Creed and all that, it's awesome to play them, it's not that fun to make them. Uh, do you know about Ninja Theory? Uh, yes, the, the company. Yeah. yeah, they will be releasing a game this summer called Hellblade. Do you know the story about it? I, I don't think so. No. So, they're trying to make a AAA game. For with the budget and the team of an indie game. <laughs> well, but indie game nowadays is very big already because some people think that indie game, in, like indies, are less than a million dollars in budget. And man, I don't know what I would do with a million dollars, but it would not be indie. It would be huge. <laughs> that being said, will we, will we consider expanding the inner city game if the opportunity arrived? The, the, the game the game, yeah. the, the game will continue to evolve because I'm working on it. Um, the, the, if you mean the company... Yeah, the, the company, the game will be the... I mean, the, now you have that, that, the, that game, will be interested in, like, I don't know, creating a multi-platform game from the, the same concept? Um, yeah, sure. Like, um, I don't know, maybe we'll... I'm, I st I'm still checking out if this is viable or how this is working, right? Uh, but if, if we're like financially viable, and if I have the opportunity to add, to you know, port again to other platforms like consoles and stuff like that, I will do it, yeah, sure. Is that it? So, since there are no further questions, I thank Ivo for coming. Thank you. It was great. Thanks. Thanks.